Good afternoon, students. In today's lecture, we'll be covering supply chain management. And what I want you to get out of this lecture is the terminology and a basic understanding of the principles, which is about all we can cover in, in one class. Um, the department also offers an elective in supply chain management taught by Dr. Marquez. I think some of the graduate students also have a supply chain management course. It's a different course, also taught by Dr. Marquez. It's an excellent area. Uh, one of the things that you always have to separate in supply chain management similar areas is practice from theory. And we're not going to discuss too much theory today, but what we are going to discuss is the vocabulary and some of the, the technologies that support supply chain management. So to review from last time, what is RFI, RFQ, and RFP? Well, RFI is request for information, right? We go out to the person and say, to the supplier, and say, we're doing a design study. Now, why is it important to tell them that it's a design study instead of a quote? Well, if you tell them it's a design study, they'll spend less effort. If you tell them a quote, they'll try to get an exact price, spend some effort. And if, you, if you're constantly asking for design studies, when it finally comes to quote, what are they going to do? They're going to put a minimum amount of effort into getting you an appropriate price, right? So it's, 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 a, it's a case of you want to only – you want to – Tell the supplier when it's information and when it's actually going to occur, which is a request for quote. And then finally, RFP is a request for proposal, which is something beyond just price and delivery terms. A proposal would include engineering drawings and similar information. Anybody tell me what a reverse auction is? Auction, which you start from uh, – we start the reverse bidding from the highest to the lowest. Okay, it's an auction where you do the bidding in reverse, essentially, which is what you said. And what you do is you post the item, and the bidders bid it in real time, right? And they can only enter a bid if what? They're cheaper than the lowest currently bid price. And what are the problems with a reverse auction? Well, the first problem is the supplier has to be constantly looking at it. It's like a game, very similar to um, buying something on eBay. So it's time consuming for your supplier. Another problem, probably the biggest problem, is you only get price information from how many suppliers? One, right? You're only guaranteed one price. Why? If the lowest cost supplier enters the price first, nobody else is going to bid on it. Another problem is that suppliers get to see the price, and so they, they may they may try to game it and enter prices, um, not the lowest price first, okay? For all those reasons, reverse auctions can sometimes cause more problems than good. Um, in some industries, suppliers flat out will not do reverse auctions. In other industries, the, 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 they, they do occur. Combinatorial auction allows suppliers to bid on collections of items. And these are used with transportation lanes or airline gates where a group of items might be better than the whole. Is it good to have many or few suppliers? Fundamental question, right? Many supplier approach basically says what? I'm going to get a fair price because everybody's going to be bidding on it. Few supplier approach says maybe I'll develop better relationships with my suppliers. Now, purchase price variance is an overused metric to gauge the performance of a purchasing department. And it's the difference between the current and the new price multiplied by the annual volume. And many organizations use this metric and call it by a different name, annual savings, annual on cost, etc. So PPV is equal to the um, current price minus new price, all that multiplied by volume, number of parts per year. Okay, so let's say the, the, price, the price of the part was $5 last year. 
and six dollars this year and we use a thousand of the parts okay or ten thousand well the PPV would be I mean, would be current would be five minus six times a thousand or minus ten thousand okay and whether or not you do current price minus new price or new price minus current price is up to the organization one way would be expressing it in terms of a savings the other way would be an on cost okay but here you would say well we're ten thousand dollars worse off this year with buying this part than last year okay and what you would do is you would take all of the parts let's say that go into this car and then compute a pr purchase price variance on all of them so the price of the parts going into the car increased or decreased by five million dollars and then you'd break it down by category the metal parts, the engine parts, the, the, the plastic parts, um, the interior parts, the wheels, and then you'd break it down by item. And you'd go through and say, well, um, the, the item cost $600 more this year than last year, and that's 300 is due to metal parts, and then the other 300 is due to non-metal, and further break it down and break it down, right? And management would look at this, and it's really good information. But it's not good for evaluating purchasing, okay? And let me argue as to why it's not the purchasing department's fault. Grading a purchasing agent for a commodity item on PPV is, il is illogical, okay? The market sets the price, so if the market's 20% down, do I give you a bonus? Not really. If the market goes up 20%, um, do you get the buyer to find a new job? That's, that's, that's not, 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 not logical. Now, for some items, PPV is logical if buyer skill is important, but I'd argue that's a fairly small set of items. At one extreme, let's say I have to buy gold to go on my semiconductors. I've got to buy so much gold per year or silver. And um, this year, gold's going to cost 20% more. Is that the fault of the buyer? No, 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 no one could ever argue that's the fault of the buyer because where's the price of gold set? New, New York Mercantile Exchange and some other exchanges around the world. Price of steel, where is that set? Well, if you, you know, it, that's the market price usually, okay? There's some private contracts in steel and oil, but for instance, price of oil goes up. Whose fault is that? Do you blame the buyer? No. Now, if the price of plastic parts goes up, you might be tempted to blame the buyer. But what is the plastic part composed of? A large chunk of it is the price of petrochemicals and the price of that particular distillate, right? Another chunk is the labor used to produce the item. Now, if the buyer went out to all the good suppliers that could be, they did their job, and this was the best price they found, well, sometimes that's just the best price, okay? So purchase price variance, somewhat useful from an information standpoint, not really something to evaluate a purchasing group by. Now, what happens if I say, Purchase price variance is how your bonus is going to be tied as a purchasing agent. Well, then the buyer can become very clever and adjust to any metric, and this, this creates gains. And a, a sa sample tactic for a new part would be to include the tooling cost the first year and then remove it the next. So get the supplier to bid high the first year to cover their tooling and then remove it the next. So the first year, the price of the part's high. And it's a new part, so we're not going to compute purchase price variance. Next year, the price is a lot lower. It's an existing part, and the buyer gets a huge bonus. And if you go through the paper listed there, unintended responses to traditional 
purchasing performance metrics, it, you know, they list about 10 problems with PPV and 10 ways buyers can cheat. So, personal commentary. PPV is not a good metric, but it is commonly used. Purchasing departments should be evaluated on process, documentation, and standards. Did they buy the correct part at the market price? Um, they should not be measured directly for market conditions. Um, so the things you want to ask is, did they follow the rules and procedures? Um, how many certified vendors were located? Did they collect pricing from everybody? Did they negotiate accurately and honestly within the rules of the organization? Did they manage their data and documentation to a high standard? You want to have high integrity in purchasing. And purchase price variance tends to lead management to play games. Everybody wants to come in and say, I saved a bunch of money, right? But sometimes that's not the story. And you, you, you've got to be careful in, in not making that people feel that they have to um, meet a metric um, in purchasing. Because at the end of the day, for most items, the market's going to set the price. Now, there are multiple types of purchasing. Um, the three common types, the first one's cost-based purchasing. Uh, no, that's not a common type. Market-based purchasing, well, neither of those are. The last one's the common one. Competitive bidding, where suppliers bid for the item, okay, which is what we've talked about up to now is the most common. Cost-based pricing is, is rarely used. It's where the supplier opens his books to the purchaser and the price upon is, is based upon time and materials or a fixed price plus escalation to accommodate changes in vendors' material cost. Uh, basically a cost plus model. You take their cost and you add a profit margin. Market-based pricing would be where we, we come up with a price based on an index. So I'm going to buy oil from you, and we're going to look every week at the, at the price of West Texas Intermediate and adjust based off that. Obviously, gold and other market-based commodities, this is good. Non-ferrous metals prices are published in Metals Week magazine, and sometimes people use that as a guide. Another important issue is payment terms. Your supplier has to know how they're going to be paid to give you an accurate price. Um, different organizations have different payment terms. And th so one organization may pay 30 days from invoice. Another may pay 30 days net from the first day of the month. Another may pay 60 days. And depending on how you pay the supplier, your price will be affected. Typically, the more prompt you are in payment, you'll get a better price, slightly. Um, payment terms will impact price due to the time value of money and processing cost. If you are a difficult company to work with, your suppliers will charge you a premium. Okay? Some companies are easy to work with, some are not. While it's a small secondary impact, payment terms do affect purchasing discussions. So now let's talk about supply chain. We've concluded purchasing. Postponement is one of those high-level strategies that usually a good idea for a supply chain. So with postponement, we want to withhold the modification and customization of the product to keep it as generic as possible. For example, HP looked at their printers and determined the power supply should be moved out of the printer itself and into the core. And this basically allows HP to ship one printer to anywhere in the world. And so all they have to change is the, the packaging and, and, and the, the documentation for the final point. Another variation of postponement is channel assembly. So we're going to send individual components and modules rather than finished products to the distributor. The distributor then assembles, tests, and ships them. And this, this, this has proven successful in, in industries undergoing rapid change, maybe personal computer and some other industries where you're going to allow that last distributor to make a minor modification. Drop shipping or direct shipping 
basically drop shipping means the supplier will send directly to the end customer rather than going through a warehouse to save time. So this is used when the, the warehouse doesn't carry inventory or doesn't currently have inventory, so they'll just route it straight from the plant instead of going through the warehouse or the reseller. Um, other cost savings measures include special packaging, labeling, optimal placement of labels on barcodes of containers. Basically, the whole idea is we can direct ship or drop ship uh, material from our plant to our suppliers. Um, blanket orders is a good concept for purchasing. Uh, a blanket order basically gives an unfulfilled order with a vendor, and so we have a contract in place. It's not an authorization to ship, it's just an agreement on how to ship and the price, and think of it as having a contract in place for parts. Another supply chain strategy is stockless purchasing. And stockless purchasing means the supplier maintains the inventory that is delivered directly to the purchaser's department rather than to a stock room. Um, if the supplier can maintain the stock of the inventory for a variety of customers who use the same product, uh, this, this can be a net savings. Basically just means that the, 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 that the supplier, you know, with stockless purchasing, basically the supplier is is maintained maintains the, the the maintains the inventory that's delivered directly to a department rather than a receiving bay kind of minor difference. So with supply chain management you want to look at strategy. Who owns what where? Remember the Inco term? And this can be extended. Um, you know, where do I want to take ownership of the item? Uh, do I want the supplier to maintain my inventories? Do I want to maintain my inventories? These are all questions. And, and that's one of the fundamental questions you have to answer when you design your supply chain, right? Where am I going to own stuff on this path? Um, we're vendor managed inventory, which we're going, which is similar to stockless purchasing. Vendor owns inventory till I use it. That's pretty radical, right? You know, they're going to, they're, they say, we're, we don't want to take ownership of inventory till it's used. You, you have a location on site where you store your inventory. And what's the advantage of that? Well, they don't have to carry the inventory cost. What's the advantage for you as a supplier? You can charge them for the privilege. And remember, when we talked about purchasing, what was the one thing I said you never want to have happen? You never want to be dependent on a supplier, right? When you're buying something, I don't want to be dependent on you. So if, if you set up this supplier and you give them space in your facility and you let them keep the stock there and keep control of your inventory, are you going to be able to change them out? No. So... You have to think about that. While you may gain from the supply chain side, you may lose other ways. And, and so that this, this is what makes supply chain management tricky. Now, the next thing in supply chain that's, that's important is the concept of standardization. And purchasing departments should make efforts to standardize um, where possible. And so that is, you know, we want to make sure that, that we, we keep a variety of labeling, coloring, packaging, and perhaps slightly different in engineering specifications. But purchasing agents really should try to standardize where possible. And there's this tug of war between purchasing and marketing. Marketing wants as many different varieties of parts as possible to sell, right? Everybody wants that. Um, the supply chain wants to keep it simple, as few variety of parts. And the best example I can think of is a pickup truck. And this will be more for our domestic students. Let's think of a pickup truck. How many different body styles does a pickup truck have? Three. At least three, right? Short cab, long cab, 
two door, four door, well, crew cab, and then the intermediate one, two and a half doors. How many different engines can you buy on a pickup truck? Two, four, five. Uh, at least four, usually, right? You can buy, with a Ford pickup truck, you can buy a, a six cylinder, a six cylinder turbocharged, uh, a, a norm, V8. normal V8, and then a massive V8. <laughs> um, so we have four engines. How many transmissions can you get? Usually two, a towing transmission and a regular transmission. How many interior packages can you get? Usually about five. Okay. And then what are some other options? Um, wheels, two, two or three wheel choices. Um, and what's the big one? Four-wheel drive, two-wheel drive. Four-wheel drive, two-wheel drive, that's another one. We, we did the transmission already. Um, the bed length. You can usually get two bed lengths, a short bed length and a long bed length. And so I'm going to get my calculator and multiply these out. Three, four, two, five, two, two, two. So there are 960, oh, we forgot color, 960 variants excluding color with color. How many color types can you get? Usually six or eight, eight. can have 7,680 combinations possible. No one dealer can hold all those combinations, right? So when you're talking about things like trucks, it's going to be very hard from a supply chain standpoint to make sure that you have adequate coverage of all the types that your dealers, as well as having all these different types of parts to manage and sequence and get in, get in the right order for your assembly. Now, why do they have 7,680 types of trucks? Anybody buy a truck in here? <laughs> oh, okay. No truck buyers in this room. Well, the, the consumer who buys trucks typically has very particular and specific taste, okay? So a lot of those option penetrations are for them, like short versus long bed. Um, a lot of people like short bed pickup trucks because, quite frankly, they're easier to get in and out of parking spaces. Other people need the additional feet to, two feet to haul items. Same with the combination of engine and transmission, right? Some people are going to use it for towing purposes. A lot of other people are never going to put a, put a um, trailer behind it, right? So there's this battle between marketing and the supply chain. The more complicated your item is, the more number of combinations they are, the, the more inventory pools you're going to have, the more total inventory you're going to have because you can't share between the pools of inventory. So in general, You want to avoid part proliferation, or at least postpone it. Another example would be specialty engineering parts, where you may sell the same part, but in 50 different configurations. The later you delay that differentiation, the less inventory you have to store. Vendor-managed inventory is an overused term, but it's a family of policies where the supplier takes full responsibility for maintaining the, the inventory. Typically, the inventory is located in the buyer's location, maybe a warehouse or a store. The terms of sales in vendor-managed inventory environments typically make the manufacturer responsible for unsold items. And think of vendor-managed inventory as a type of consignment stock. 
So what happens in VMI is you're basically saying that you have this space in my facility, and this you own this space, and you're responsible for managing the inventory, and I just pull out the inventory whenever I need it, and the sale occurs when I need it. And, you know, you, we'll give you a little space in my overall facility. What could go wrong with this? Well, one thing is the supplier will know that it's hard to get rid of you, may charge you higher prices. Um, another problem is the supplier is going to charge you for the um, privilege of holding that inventory to the last minute. So you're really moving inventory costs from your books to his, the supplier's books, and it's going into the price of the item. Um, the final problem is that does the supplier know, have a better idea of how much you're going to use, or do you? One would hope I would know how much stuff I was going to use, not the supplier. Think about it. Does HEB know how many eggs I'm going to use this week? No. Would I have a better idea? Probably. Okay? So VMI, what I'm really saying is that the supplier knows my business as well as I do and can manage my inventory better than I can, and I'm just really bad at managing inventory. So... You know, it, it has been used in this country. It's a way of hiding cost because you're changing inventory cost to piece price cost. Um, I'm not a huge fan. There may be conditions where it warrants it, um, especially if it's like a specialized skill for holding the inventory. Let's say you, ha you use welding equipment in your facility. Well, you may get a welding company in there to manage the welding tools where they're doing repair as well as inventory. That might be, be a good use of VMI. So VMI, the manufacturer, basically uh, requires that the supplier assume the role of managing inventory. Close relationship between the supplier and the, the customer ensures good communication. VMI has many forms, but generally it requires um, the supplier take control of inventory and transportation later in the process. And supplier-controlled warehouse is similar to VMI. So I'm going to pause the first part of this lecture and continue with EDI in a moment.